Um, as, Hi. <laughs> yeah, as mentioned before, my name is Chris Adams. Um, I work as the executive director of the Green Web Foundation. It's a Dutch nonprofit focused around the idea of a fossil free internet. And we do that using open source, open culture, and pretty much open, basically, as a, as, as a strategy. Um, rather than have a whole slide, a set of slides, we were going to have a kind of fireside chat thing. So you just have to imagine that there's a fire, but in a good way, not like a bad fire, right, for this room. Um, yeah, and I'll hand over to Ines, and then we'll just talk a little bit about the good, the bad, and the ugly of front-end development, uh, so green coding on the, on the front end. So if you're a developer and you want to build websites, we're going to be talking a little bit about that. But if you're not a developer, we'll try to keep this accessible so that it isn't just angle brackets and code snippets all day long. All right, with that, I'm going to hand over to Ines. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, my name is Ines. I'm a web performance and sustainable web consultant. So I've been working with clients to help them optimize their website for energy efficiency, for web performance, for you know less carbon emissions generally, for better user experience. And yeah, I come from a background in front-end development, also have a master's degree in telecommunication and, and information technology, so this kind of network part was, part was always super interesting for me. So yeah, I'm a, a very techie person right here, so I would, I would like to go super deep dive into this. So also like one question before we go, so Tim did ask you a bit about your background, but can you, can you like just raise your hand if you're in web development, please, just for us to know. Okay, so just a few of us. So okay, no, no, no JavaScript. That was about twenty-five percent, maybe a third of the of the room here. All right. Well, in that case, what I'm going to do, um, I'll put the first question. We're going to first ask about what makes a good user experience as a web developer, and how does that kind of impact the planet? What's like a good example of good things for the planet? We then talk about what's kind of bad and some of the not so great examples, and then we may open the floor for some questions because I imagine things we talk about will, will prompt questions. So if I start, first of all, what does make uh, examples of good, ex good user experience and websites that are good for the planet? If you can start, Linus, or go from there. Sure. Smaller. <laughs> Leaner. <laughs> Yeah, so I have a feeling, so to be honest, I have a feeling it's improving, but yeah, over, over the last years, there was this a trend of putting so much things on the website, and I think in general, users, when they come to the website, I guess, I'm not going to ask this question because all of you are going to raise the hand if I ask who here uses websites, no? So like, if you think about yourself as a user, what do you want to actually do? You no, know, like you want to do something, you want to buy something, you want to read something. And basically there is so many features that are unfortunately, I guess, kind of stopping us from doing this efficiently in a way. So I guess kind of my view on the website would be that it's kind of fast and efficient and it kind of gives you for what you came from. But for what you came for, that's kind of, I would say that's kind of my, my view on a uh, yeah, okay. good website. What do you think? All right. Um, I've just realized that uh, what you can see behind you is a not very easy to see link. Uh, what you should see is a, a link to a shared notepad uh, called Etherpad, which basically has a bunch of the stuff we'll be talking about. And as we are talking about lots of projects here, I know about you, but I find it really helpful to have links to follow up afterwards, after this talk. Uh, so I think the gentleman at the back, if you'd be so kind as to show the link that we had before rather than the thing that gets rendered on the page, anyone who is actually wants to follow along or add some questions, they will be able to see this as well. And you'll see more or less what we're going to be co talk to covering. Yeah, this is the one. If you follow there, you'll basically go onto a page which has a bunch of the notes that I've been adding. You're free to add them. Please be nice. But also, that gives you some examples and links to some of the things we're talking about. Like an example would be this showcase of low carbon websites, which is called Low Carbon with three W's. See, get it? Get it? WWW, right? Uh, that's an example. But another one that we spoke about was this idea of carbon aware websites. And maybe if you start talking about like one of the good examples, then we'll touch on one of the bad examples a little bit later, for example. Sure. Uh, okay, so yeah. Uh, when we talk about the good examples in general, of course, we want to give user 
the preference, you know, to choose. That's also one of the things because uh, now, now there is also, I think uh, the, the talk before us also touched a bit upon this definition. You know, and a lot of times I also kind of get asked the difference between green and sustainable. You no, know? and just also to kind of touch upon that, it's usually you no. Know, when when I when I talk about it, green, you no, know, we're talking about lowering carbon emissions. Sustainable is so much more. You no, know? we're talking about economic, about like people, about all, all of this, this this parts as well inside. So, kind of. Uh, respecting user preferences, this is also something that a good website do. So this is what, one very, very cool thing that, that's been happening. So I guess a lot of you know about edge computing as well. No, it's a building, a, a putting uh, uh, computing, of course, and all that closer to the user. So a colleague of Chris, for Irani, who is, I'm a huge fan of his, in general, in his work, he created this carbon aware website, which basically on the edge worker checks for the carbon intensity of a user's network, like all of the, you know, uh, grid, sorry, of the user's grid at that point in time, and then decides which version to serve you depending on that. So I think this is already like a small breakthrough, like a small, like a very good idea how to start using uh, these, so for example, tools such as uh, uh, electricity maps, which actually gives you this data. So using stuff like this to actually steer it towards, uh, towards a kind of greener, greener uh, delivery. There's another example that you might be able to see that has actually linked inside these notes. There's a website called Branch Magazine that uh, we worked on in 2020. When I say we, I'm talking about um, uh, the Green Web Foundation, where I work, uh, along with an uh, online community called climateaction.tech. It's a magazine which is about the intersection of climate and technology. So it's going to have people like people, folks from Amazon and Microsoft talking, but it's also got the views of people from the Amazon talking as well. So the idea is to get a large section of people involved. But this was one of the first kind of showcases of carbon aware web design, where if you are viewing the web page when there are lots of fossil fuels on the electricity grid, because basically your usage is going to have more carbon associated, you will see a stripped back kind of low carbon version of this website. But if you visit the website right now, because it's really windy right now, it's going to be bright green. You're going to have a really nice full fat version of this website with really rich pictures and everything like this. And this is like one example of being able to kind of work in kind of in rhythm with some of the kind of natural rhythms that we have happening around us. Uh, that's one example of this, and there are now a number of other companies and other websites which kind of follow this idea. Uh, you typically might see this happening at the server side, but this is one that you can experience directly yourself. And we're going to talk a little bit about how this is actually used in other aspects of this a little bit later. But I figured while we're talking about some of the examples here, and maybe we're talking a little bit about the role that accessibility plays when you're talking about sustainable web here. Ines, I'll hand over to you for this one. Sure, yeah. So uh, accessibility definitely goes in the, of course, this whole big picture of sustainability. And in general, uh, when designing website, designing it for every single user, designing it to be backwards compatible, designing it to be um, just, you know, a lot of times, I guess, like I can talk about this topic for ages, but just kind of to set up the stage for this, like accessibility and designing, no, for it's usually for you know visual impaired, for hearing impaired, and I guess that the very important part to 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 kind of have a feeling here is that it's not only designing for people who are, let's say, visually impaired all the time. All of us are visually impaired at some point in time. No, you're blinded by the by the reflector like we are right now. Or again, as the, you know, let's say more or less new mom, I learned to do everything with one hand. It's very hard work that you like you cannot actually type with two fingers. And like no one thinks about like these things when designing. Okay, sorry, not no one, but a lot of times people don't think about these things. So kind of uh, adapting these websites towards a higher audience, and then very, very important part not making people change their hardware in order to keep up with these new designs. And actually one of very, very funny stories I have about this is that my friend told me a few, uh, few weeks back is that her dad had to buy a new phone because he couldn't access his parking app anymore. 
And it was like a two-year-old phone, something like this. So basically, you know, stuff like this, when I hear things like this, it was like, okay, we're not talking about accessibility, just about being able to access inside of the app, but also to being able to access the app itself without having to buy a new software for something as basic as this. No, we're not, okay. It was parking. That's, that's not gonna get into this, this topic generally, but I guess, you know, this is something that, that you should not be, you know, you cannot choose another provider, let's just say like this, you know, so you don't get a choice of installing a different app, this is the one you have to use, and basically the software is making you, yeah. And the thing that it may be useful to know about is that this is explicitly called out in the W3C guidelines. The W3, the Sustainable Web Guidelines that Lucas was talking about, they refer to this as one of like the principles you want to be following. The other thing to bear in mind is that and if you're looking for some data to actually back some of this up, there's a really nice example from 2021 where I believe it was uh, the University of Wisconsin. I've shared the link to this. If I've, so I've got, if I've got the name of the university wrong, please just look there. What they ended up doing was you had a bunch of people who run a bunch of the learning software for their students. And uh, they could see inexplicably uh, that loads and loads of old devices disappeared from all their, uh, from, 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 from all the analytics, which kind of gave the impression that, oh, is, is this a good thing? Is this a bad thing? It's a little bit like, is anyone familiar with the meme where you see like the bombers coming back with all the holes on uh, the wings but not the engines? No? Okay. That's an internet meme that I will have to link to later on. But basically, the, th the thing they found was by changing the, some of their choices of learning software were basically forcing updates across their entire student uh, body. And when you've got like 20,000 students, forcing everyone just to buy a new phone or a new iPhone to access something is a really kind of concrete example of, okay, this is how a change made at the web, web, the web impact uh, at, on the web can basically have a real world uh, impact in terms of embodied carbon for this. Uh, I think that's, those are some examples. Should we talk a little bit about some other bad user experience and some anti-patterns you've seen before? Mm -hmm. Like a, we might talk a little bit about another example of carbon-aware web design that has been applied on a recent high-profile website. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, there is there is also so this carbon aware website when we're talking about so Branch Magazine No has uh, a very good example of this how you actually should implement because there is. I guess a lot of you have heard about the term called progressive enhancement. So this is something that we would like to strive towards in a way that depending on what user situation is, you know, so many times we uh, especially People, people in web development, we're a lot of times these power users. We live in our tech bubbles, so a lot of times, like, you know, I'm guilty first myself as well. Like, I don't have a feeling how bad it can be for someone, you know, with, a, with let's say, you know, a lower-end phone, and then, like, every time I take a, a train between Munich and, and Berlin, this is when I realized what the bad network is as well. So it's kind of, you know, all of these things. Uh, you don't have a feeling about this, so you don't take it into consideration. And using this progressive enhancement is something that can actually address all of these because you can deliver something very, very basic and then go ahead and build on top of these depending on different factors, no? depending on, for example, the carbon situation or in the end of the day, depending on what users decide. Let's say that user has a safe data mode uh, turned on uh, on the, their uh, devices or, for example, they have the battery. You know, my, my phone goes into this, like, you know, data, uh, sorry, power saving mode after 20%. So at this point in time, you know, we start using less energy and all that. So why is still the same site? Why is site not taking this into consideration? So. One of the bad examples that you were saying, no, is the, is the CEO... The COP28 yes. website. Are you familiar with like COP28 happening um, in a few days' time yeah. and, uh, with an uh, oil CEO as the president of the climate conference? They have a website which explicitly shows this idea of carbon-aware design, but there's a few things that are kind of considered anti-patterns that it might birth just talking about now, and yeah. I'll hand over to you now for the seniors. Yeah, basically what's happening there is they're doing it other way around. So they're giving you the full-blown experience, and then there is like an opt-out button where you now you actually check this button, and then it goes to a lower version, which to be honest, it's a very weird since everything was already downloaded and everything is already ready. So kind of providing this, like, you know, 
going down after the users already seen everything, this is a bit of a, you know, it's kind of at this moment where it has, you have a feeling that you're doing something, but basically you're not doing anything because everything is already there, no? So this is like the, op it's basically the opposite of uh, progressive enhancement. Yeah. Rather than doing the minimum amount of work, then progressively doing more. When you visit the website, your browser does all the hard work, and then at the end, you, you have the option to then do a little Hide bit of work it. afterwards, yeah. which feels like it's like a flip of the, the plan. Um, another example that we might look at is when people are actually just building websites in total. There is a, there's a, there's a useful resource called the HTTP archive, and uh, there's actually, every year, there are significant amounts of data shared about basically how people use the web, what makes up most websites. Um, I'll hand over for you to talk a little bit about this one here, because mm. this was uh, over the, we might use, a, you, you might kind of access a website, but there's a bunch of stuff which is often sent over the wire that you cannot use, but hasn't been taken out. And I'll hand over to you to explain that in a bit more detail. Yeah, so this is, this is actually, I would say, basically the core of designing green web in a way is, I call it the Marie Kondo method, no? Take your JavaScript and throw it away. So basically, it's just, just this part of removing the things that are not used. Because there is so much, so if you, if you see the HTTP archive, uh, to be honest, I, I'm not sure about the actual numbers, but there is every single website that you analyze. So I've been working as a web performance um, engineer for a while, so I've seen and analyzed for web performance many sites over the year, and every single time, there is such an amount of unused resource. And this is the issue, no? It's not the issue, all of these things that we do use, that, okay, there is too much stuff anyway, but let's not focus on this. Let's just focus on the part that is just there, sitting, using resources, but not providing any like, value to the user. There's another concrete example which I learned about yesterday when speaking to Florian. Uh, F F Florian and in the in in the audience here, he's running a work, he's running a session at four o'clock here, talking about some of the specifics about how to use profiling tools to identify some of these spikes in energy usage. And uh, we heard a story about essentially. Actually, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna ruin it. I'll, I'll, I'll save it for, for Florian at four o'clock. Actually, that makes much more sense. But generally, the the headline is the CSS animation that can cook an egg on your laptop is the best way to think about it. There are certain things you can do that can trigger so much CPU usage that you cannot even perceive because you're redrawing a screen. That is a, is a really good example of unintentionally in, in, inducing lots and lots of energy use at, uh, on, on the client side, which usually isn't intended. Um, I think I'm just going to look through this, and it looks like we've actually had some people filling in some information here. Uh, that I w th so the, the basically the shared notes, the thing seems to be working. Someone's actually fleshed out this idea of. I spoke a bit, bit more about this idea of um, looking at the analytics and seeing old phones disappear from analytics. There's a bit more information, a link to survivorship bias to explain that in a bit more detail now. Um, I think at this point here, we're coming up to time, but I want to open the floor if there's any questions from the audience here. If we have one at the far back, yes, uh, Tim. Oh, okay, oh. there is a third mic, awesome. Yeah, that gentleman over there, yeah. There is like, sorry, there is just like so much to talk about the topic. So we kind of jumped around a bit like about, so hopefully, hopefully uh, we can set you up the stage to actually ask us more. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. First of all, thank you very much again. Great talk. Um, the concept of carbon awareness in the front end is pretty new. I have heard about it for quite a while. The um, uh, Branch Magazine, as you said, has this website up and running for quite a while now. Uh, what I was interested in is, do, do you, are you aware of any studies, any kind of papers that have gone a little further and analyzed the user behavior and the user interaction with that website and whether it actually helps. Because, so, sh should I elaborate a little further? Why? Please do, yeah, okay. go for it. Um, so, I noticed when, when I showed this to people, first instinct was to play around with it, right? You, yep. you want to see what's the lowest, uh, like what does it look like if, if, if um, carbon intensity is quite high, what if it's quite low, and all the steps in between. So that is additional traffic, mm -hmm. uh, but I would assume that that in, has a kind of effect that people get used to it, and sooner or later they learn how to interact with that, right? Um, 
But once we're over that phase, I'm questioning, or I'm, I'm skeptical almost, curious, curious, that's the word, um, how would people go about this? Imagine an Amazon or booking.com carbon aware, what would it look like? So the question is, what would it look like if Amazon adopted this, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, or, or any kind of website that's qu frequently used where the user interaction directly is linked to the success of the company, right? If you're f looking for a hotel on any kind of platform, you're interested in the pictures. And on Branch Magazine, one of the first things that you made carbon aware was the pictures. If I'm not able to see where I'm going to stay, I'm probably not going to go by name. Um, maybe by address um, and maybe by star ratings, but that doesn't tell me a whole lot where I'd feel welcome in the place that I'm staying for X That's amount. Fair. So the example that it may be useful to refer to here is that there's a web, there's a, a, at least one e-commerce website that started that took this on. Um, I think they're called Low Basics. Um, I'll share a link to this inside of the shared notes for this. That's one example. The other thing that's worth bearing in mind is that when this stuff is done correct, it, it's very important to kind of leave agency with the actual end users at the end because uh, an early Apple, Apple, the you know well-known two trillion dollar tech uh, phone com um, computer company, they also have started adopting some of these ideas into uh, basically charging devices, and uh, an early version of this was very very poorly received because essentially you would charge uh, you you would, you would plug a phone into a wall. And then if you maybe just left it overnight and it was uh, particularly high carbon intensity electri electricity overnight, you would wake up to an uncharged phone, which is not what you want to actually have. Uh, we're actually the, we're at the point now where we've only really started to see large scale adoption of this at the kind of end user device level in the last 12 to 18 months, I think. So we don't actually have the numbers yet to know, uh, to quantify what the savings might be. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's one, th so, so that's one example, but the earlier question about what would a website look like, the thing you might refer to is just look how websites are currently designed with a kind of progressive enhancement based approach right now, mm -hmm. where they already are doing some of this stuff. And it may be the choice that, it may, it may be the choice that you only choose to load the images that you really need to see to check, ch check that. That's like one example, and that's one of the idea of leaving the agency with an end user. And like, I'll hand over to Ines to add a bit more questions, or a bit more color, because she's the consultant, basically. <laughs> yeah, well, um, you're completely right, you know, when it comes to this. Uh, a lot of times, first thing to cut is the images, you know? And as a, someone who uses Booking a lot by my, like myself, I definitely do want to see how it looks, where am I going, and all that. But you wouldn't believe how many people don't know how to compress an image. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so this is, I think, one of the huge deals. So I was working also with the client this year, and the most savings I managed to do on the website was just optimizing images. Just, you know, uh, actually, two days ago, I found that they are loading a full-blown, you know, 100% office viewport width image, in this small container it's because yeah so you know and, and so I think it's like hundred times hundred pixels off an image and they're loading a full-blown 1900 pixel image for this small container and it's so many small things like this that I found over over this year with this one client only so basically uh, even if you need something and this is also I, I like this example as well with fonts so I'm a, I'm a bit of a crazy person when it comes to this. So my personal website has a font. I wanted to do it without the font. Then I was like, you know what? Fonts are important. They give a bit of a, you know, a personality. They give a bit of a design. You know, it's very hard to uh, basically um, fight designers on this. However, I needed the font for nine letters of my name and surname that was it that's what i needed capital i small n small e so i think you can see where i'm going with this so basically what i did is i subset the font to only those nine letters i need and i went from 40k to 4k so i still do i still have all the benefits this is a bit of an over optimization to be honest but i did try that with a bit larger scale so if you load a font, full-blown font with all the characters, 
I think it, it was around 200 kilobytes of this one font. And a lot of sites have, you know, bold, italic, all of these things. Then if you go a bit down to just subsetting Latin, for example, you already go to 40. So basically just kind of trying to find these optimizations where you can remove these things that are just not necessary on the page. This is something that already, you know, does a lot also with the I don't even think that you need a progressive enhancement. However, you can do it, for example, with the fonts. I don't think the fonts would affect that much conversion rate. And then again, like if you progressively enhance them at some point, whoever has a very, you know, a lot of uh, a good data plan and of course a good uh, device, they can also get the full blown experience. And to be honest, as a user, I really don't care which sans serif is my blog written in, so. I hope that goes some way to answering the question. Tim? Totally, um, yeah. Thank yeah. you very much. Okay, Tim, I'm just going to check about time because I, I, I believe we're coming past three o'clock. How are yes. we doing? I, I just wanted to inform you. You have five to six minutes left okay. and you can fill it with that, whatever you want. Uh, there were some questions over there. We, we can just talk and you go if you want to have a there's coffee. A, there's <laughs> a question at the uh, There, there, there at was the a hand sign there somewhere I just wanted to tell you. but. I mean, you're speaking so good, you should open a podcast or something. <laughs> That's a joke because there's a podcast by the Green Software Foundation that I host. Uh, so if you go to podcast.greensoftwarefoundation, um, it's one place that's been running for the last year and a half where we dive very, very deep into some of these subjects with experts to pull out some of these details for people to adopt and figure out how to do. Um, yeah, sorry. Uh, <laughs> And then there's a question. There was a, there was a question at the back as well. Fan. Yes, hello, and thank you, thank you for your insights, and thank you also for the podcast. It's a little weird to see you actually in person this time because you're every week in my ear, and now, and it's looking exactly like this. Maybe I should close my eyes. So, <laughs> anyhow, regarding the question, uh, it's about analytics. I want to hear your opinion and maybe also experiences with this because I'm not so deep in web development, more on the architecture side. And one of from various reasons, because on the one side, I think it has a huge impact on the internet traffic. And on the second side, I wonder why do clients still want this? I mean, I don't know nobody who still clicks except on all cookie policies, but I still got the requirements from my clients and I'm also working as a consultant um, to implement Google Analytics, LinkedIn marketing campaigns, Adobe and everything on top, for the one hand, it's huge internet traffic without huge benefit, especially because nobody clicks. Or your opinion and thought on this and would be great. So if I understand, the question is basically, I have people asking for all this massive heavy analytics script to be sent to a web page. How can I talk people into seeing, being a bit more moderate about this or finding out whether it's worth the extra kind of weight over the wire? Yeah. I might hand over to Ines on this one if that's the, que if that's the question. Oh, <laughs> a thorn in my tie. Uh, to be honest, it's also, it's a very hard task. So I've, again, I work with a lot of clients and this is also one of the first place, you know, the third parties generally, you know, like I guess you're referring to general third parties, you know, all of these pixels and stuff that, 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 yeah, that exactly. gets, get added. Analytics, I think, are not going away, unfortunately. So what we can do here is, encourage companies to switch to the lightweight analytics. So there is definitely way like, well, privacy concerned as well, you know, way more lightweight and just, you know, depending what you need. And again, I think Google Analytics is a very powerful tool, but do we need the full blown power of this? That's not a rhetorical question. That's an actual question. No, like maybe the answer is yes, we need. Of course, if you need it, feel free to use it, but always think, do I need every single of these and can I replace it? So I think that's the first thing. And then second, when it comes to the third parties itself, what I did actually a few years back with one client, because I, I noticed this, like a ridiculous amount of third parties. I opened Excel sheet. I started writing it down. They had 25 different third parties. And just side notes, these people started calling me mean performance lady as some, every time I would come on site. But basically I made them go through all of this list and give me the responsible for person for every single one of them. What it ended up being is that they're using about three and all the others were added at some point in time and then no one ever touched them again. 
And I think the worst one was actually Hotjar. So if you ever heard about this, this is kind of the, the tracking tool for UX. So basically it tracks what you're doing on the page and creates this heat map to help user, user experience designers optimize the website. And what, how you usually use this is that basically you install it for a week or two, and then you have your data, you analyze your data, but you remove it. They never did. So they were loading, and it's a huge thing. I think it's like, I don't know, 300, 400 kilobytes that they were loading for years because no one just removed it. So I think when it comes to this is embrace it. That's the first thing. If they say no, oh, well, it, you know, it is what it is. Of course, try to fight to go a bit lower, you know, just for the, for the things that uh, they actually need. And then, of course, clean it up, clean it up, clean it up, iterate, you know, always like, you know, hit them on the fingers, you know, please, who is responsible? Do you still need this? And always iterate, iterate, iterate over this. So like your job is never done there. Okay, thank you, Ines. The thing I might also share is on Branch Magazine and okay, we, I work in a nonprofit where we talk about this stuff and if we did this really, really poorly, we basically look like idiots, uh, right? And uh, we've found a tool. We use a service called Cabin, uh, which basically doesn't use any cookies and has a very particular way of structuring data, which means that it's very, 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 very small. Uh, that's not the only, only provider. There's a number of smaller third uh, ones, which are not the big three, that actually provide this kind of analytics. It lets you see, okay, who's using your website or, or, or moreover, which parts are actually popular, but they might not tell you who is that person who did that? Because some, sometimes you might not need to know that information. Okay, I hope that answers the question. Um, Tim, how are we doing for time now? Uh, it's, uh, you're running a little bit late. That's why, uh, uh, is your answer, uh, is your question? Oh, thank, you. thank you, yeah. All right. Okay, uh, uh, thanks for being so open about this. I'm very sorry, but I have to say there's no more time for more questions now. I'm sorry for this. Maybe you can do this in private later. But also, I wanted to invite you to maybe give an ending statement or a final phrase for all of us in the audience here. Anyways, thank you for giving this talk and the audience might well check out your podcast. I'll hand over to Ines. If, did you, so are, you, are you asking, is there a, fi a final remark that you want from us? Yes, please. Oh, cripes. Okay. Sure. <laughs> tell, us, tell us anything. Just doesn't lead to more questions. And I'm going to buy some time and say, if you do want, if you've got any further questions from this, please write in there and I'll answer it or we'll do our best to answer it in there asynchronously outside of this one here. Um, and hopefully that should have bought enough time for Ines to come up with a nice kind of pissy <laughs> thing to share. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I would say it's a complex topic in general. No, what we've discussed generally today, you know, with all of these, it's a complex topic. It's, it's a very fine balance between, you know, designing something sustainable and designing it, of course, you know, again, providing a very good user experience. Sometimes it kind of clashes. Sometimes it actually complements each other. But yeah, as a first thing, you know, first step, I would just say, of course, Go read about, like, if we, if we kind of, you know, interested in the topic, go read about a little bit more about it. W3C, Green Web Foundation, uh, Green Software Foundation. You can, like, find a lot of resources and clean up the things you don't use. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Ines, for the hands-on examples. I think everybody of us know, uh, knows now what to expect and what to deal with and that you have to make the picture smaller and so on. <laughs> little, little, little things matter. Check the small pictures, check the small pictures. <laughs> I'm going to come for you, I mean performance lady. So I understand there's coffee downstairs now, right? Yes, after your final words, of course. Oh, we didn't forget you. You're <laughs> okay. <you're laughs> you uh, so the, okay, the thing I would say, and you know, Okay, I'm going to say that there, there is a mnemonic that I use when I think about websites. Uh, instead of green, I use the word gold, which, uh, which I use to mean green, open, lean, and distributed. Uh, these are the principles that a content management system called Wagtail has adopted in their recent work to kind of make their own software more sustainable. Uh, so if you think about green, think gold, and uh, yeah, that's it. Cheers. <laughs>